Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Say hello to a new era of mental health care. Cerebral is here to help you achieve your mental wellness goals with professional therapy and medication management support. 100% online. You'll experience the all new Cerebral way, an innovative approach to mental wellness designed around you. You'll get a personalized treatment plan from a therapist, prescriber, or both in a safe and judgment-free space. Your cerebral therapist or prescriber will outline a customized plan with clear milestones along the way, so you can get to feeling your best. With Cerebral, you're not alone in your mental health journey. We're here to empower you to live a fulfilling life. So take that first step towards a brighter future and sign up today at Cerebral.com slash podcast and use code ACAST to get 15% off your first month. Offer only valid on monthly plans. Other exclusions may apply. Offer ends July 31st, 2024. See site for details. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot. We charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Hey there, it's Michelle Norris. I'm host of a podcast called Your Mama's Kitchen. When I travel, I'm usually looking for a way to find a taste of home when I'm not at home. And one of the things I love to do when I am at home is entertain. And Airbnb allows me to do that. When I was in California recently, I rented a house that had a great kitchen. And when we were sitting around the table, we're all thinking, we're in someone else's house. Someone could be in all of our homes as well. If you have a home, but you're not always at home, you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I'm just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Dr. Jan Eppingstall, an Australian counsellor with a PhD in hoarding who specialises in working with people who hoard. How are you, Jan? Fabulous. Thank you for asking. Glad to hear it. So in Jan's last episode, we talked about why hoarders acquire, why it can be a compulsive aspect of hoarding disorder. And so this time we're going to talk about what we can do about it. So after our last episode about why it all happens, I was really struck with how many of the reasons are common amongst many people, just kind of more extreme or more distorted in people who hoard. In a similar way that I can have one beer, and that can be a nice thing to do, but somebody else, if they have one, will have eight and can't stop. It seems there are parallels there. And this kind of always wanting new things is in modern day Western societies, at least, quite normal thinking, but just massively exaggerated (laughs) in a lot of people who hoard. And I think that makes it harder to address to some degree, because we can't reasonably be all or nothing about it. Like if you can't have one beer without having eight, the best plan of action is often to have no beers at all. But we can't most of us just stop ever going to the shops or ever going on the internet. Exactly. Yeah. So does that mean that tactics that people might consider 
extreme, like banning yourself from ever buying anything again, or bound for failure. Yeah, it's similar to food, right? I mean, we can't avoid food completely. Um, and we can't sidestep shopping. We ban ourselves, like I know I've done it in the past, ban ourselves from eating our binge foods and things like that. It doesn't actually work. And, you know, poor eating behaviours are just, you know, part of the part of the kind of problem. But we can't stop visiting these shops. We have to still shop. I think the idea of banning is sort of connected to the idea of willpower and restraint, you know, morally upstanding citizens kind of are able to withstand temptation and all that kind of thing and that we're bad people if we can't do that. But I think the desire to buy will still build up if we ban ourselves from doing it. And we're likely to actually binge shop if we do deny ourselves. And we'll just, I know that people feel sick with regret when they go out on a binge and come back. They've sort of had that almost dissociative kind of episode where they rushed off to the shops and bought all this stuff and come home and just have this, see it all together and have this kind of overwhelming feeling of regret. Or when all the Amazon boxes arrive and you're just like, oh, what have I done? (sighs) Wow. I've forgotten about that. Oh, I've forgotten about that completely. Um, You know, every time an over shopper over shops, that behavior pattern is strengthened and um, and recovery is kind of thwarted. So the idea of banning shopping won't actually work. It's all about that balance, isn't it? It's, you know, all or nothing is just a roller coaster um, and we need to kind of have that balance between cost and benefit. And I think what's, you know, we need to weigh up what feels good to us versus what is good for us. Uh, and that can be really hard because <laughs> we have to dig <laughs> deep and look at things and we actually have to turn um, internally and see what's what's happening. Um, I do bang on about values, but this is central to understanding what is good for you. Is this purchase a vote towards the person I want to be, as we've spoken before? And values are kind of a shortcut to decision making because we can ask that person, that purchase, we can look at that purchase and say, are you representative of who I'd like to be moving forward? And the answer usually is a quite clear yes or no. Yeah. And I guess there can be a role if you know that you're particularly susceptible in certain states or in certain places, Mm -hmm. you might want to ban yourself from pound shops or dollar stores if you know that you cannot go in one sensibly. Or you might want to not smoke weed if you know that you will go online and buy all kinds of frivolous Brownies. Yes. Yeah, brownies. Exactly. <laughs> that Edibles. Kind of... Something yes. like that. <laughs> um, I think that it's understanding those triggers, you know, like working that out, like digging deep and kind of going, when is it that, what are the situational, you know, emotional, cognitive kind of contextual reasons why I overshop? Um, and that can be hard for people. People don't want to, I think a lot of people don't want to know. Yeah. Um, it's just easier to say I can't control it than actually look at what's happening. Uh, yeah, if there are triggers like discount shops, like whatever it is that trips you up, then avoiding mm. that while acknowledging that you will still have to go to the supermarket sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. I've got a client who is, she has banned herself from op shops or charity shops. Um, because she recognises that she has this kind of overwhelming, you know, rush of excitement and she just will want to buy everything. And so the stuff coming in has virtually stopped other than food and the necessities, you know, and that has worked well for her. I don't know if long term she's going to be able to remain that way, but um, in the short term, stopping what's coming in is only going to help move and then we can move things out we talked a lot last time about dopamine how making a purchase or finding a freebie can induce a dopamine hit which feels great and kind of compels the behavior is it possible to find other ways of getting a dopamine hit to try and replace 
some of the acquiring behaviors with those alternatives? And if so, how else can people seek out <laughs> that sweet, sweet dopamine? Oh, the sweet dopamine. Um, this is kind of relatively individual and making and tailor making specific activities to kind of push your own dopamine buttons is really important. Um, and I think it's specific to that underlying sort of authentic need for why you're over shopping or why you're doing this particular behavior. You know, like if you shop because you want to chat to the staff, then potentially loneliness is that kind of underlying need. So maybe swap that up for calling someone or meeting someone for a coffee. Because I don't know about you, but if I get off the phone from someone, I'm always feeling fab. You know, yeah. like I'm always just bubbly, like, yes, I had this wonderful chat with a really good friend. And I just feel, you know, I kind of feel propelled towards good things. Um, but other ones that kind general ones that come to mind uh, for me are exercise. Sunlight can do wonders, like getting the sun on our retinas is really important for our brain and that can give you a huge boost. And I don't mean like looking directly into the sun. I just mean, you know, sitting in the sun. <laughs> not to, to just do not stare at the sun, people. But just, you know, being there. You know when you sit outside and the sun's just bathing you and you just feel amazing? So that can really work well. I mean, we've had some pretty terrible weather in Melbourne lately, so I haven't been able to do that. But yesterday I did it and it was magnificent. Sitting around with family and friends outside with some sunlight I could the, the the shopping was so far from my mind because it was just such a wonderful um experience I see increasingly people are setting up like community cafes and things that specifically are there well anybody can go in but you're it's for people who don't maybe have many friends or don't maybe know people it's somewhere you can go and chat to the other people there Exactly. We've got that around us. Yeah. Chatty Cafe, it's called. Cool. Yeah. And it's lovely because, it, you know, I'm really lucky in that I have brilliant friends, but not everybody does for a million reasons. And if you've got somewhere you feel confident, you can spend 20 minutes just just chatting about nothing with somebody who also went there because they fancy a chat with somebody. You know, it's it sounds ideal to me. Yeah, exactly. And there's also another um, another avenue. I don't know if you have it in the UK, but in Australia, we have a thing called Friendline. Um, and I've actually done some volunteer work there. And that is exactly that. For people who just want to chat about anything, doesn't have to be anything specific, just have a chat. So it's not and, a crisis line? or No, not at all. And that's the part that's wonderful about it. You just ring and you get someone on the phone who's there to listen, who's, you know, just happy, just up for a chat. Yeah. And I just found it really rewarding as a call taker. And I know that people would ring and they would ring quite often at a similar time on a similar day. And I'd kind of get to know people quite well. And it was a mixed bag. You know, we had people who, um, you know, people who were lonely, uh, elderly people, but then there were young people, young guys who just didn't know how to talk to women or didn't know how to talk to people generally. So they would get a bit of practice in and it, it just a great option. So yeah, friend line is really good. I don't know of anything like that here. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for any Australian listeners. But it also strikes me that, say, for 30 years, you rang your mum at seven o'clock on a Thursday, and then your mum dies, and seven o'clock on a Thursday is a big gaping hole. Being able to call friend line sounds like the perfect thing to do at seven o'clock on a Thursday. Just so great. And that was I actually, <laughs> funny you say that, I did have someone that that was what it was about. Right. <laughs> they had, you know, they would call. They wanted to call their mum, and their mum wasn't there, so they'd ring us, and we'd just have, you know, a nice twenty-minute conversation, and you know, they'd leave feeling really happy 
Um, and you would you get a lot of great feedback from people. It just was such a nice, nice feeling. So I think that's a really good one. And music is also really good. Like if you can find some music that really makes you happy, I, I find that is way better than a shopping spree. I just feel like, a, you know, something that's a bit upbeat. Um, I feel like I can get the same high from music as I can from shopping. And without the uh, <laughs> without the bank balance <laughs> diminishing <laughs> Spotify, <laughs> just turn on happy happy tunes or something, you know. But yeah, really finding activities that you love that make your heart feel full and sitting down and trying to work out what those are is key. Um, and I always will pop in pet and animal because I just find animals um, and their unconditional kind of love is just yeah you can't. You can't um, go past it. Being in nature. Being in nature. Well, there's, yeah, I think, I think you're right. It's not like we can say what will replace the dopamine hit for you, individual listener, is this. But mm. if you look at the rest of your life and see what makes you feel that kind of thrill mm. and see if you can add more of it, basically. Mm. Exactly. Like I think some people, because there is a bit of a thrill-seeking nature to shopping, I think, in some ways. Especially charity shops where you're like, yeah, because there's no guarantees, but you might find the most amazing thing. Exactly. And people are wanting to replicate that. So if that's jumping out of a plane, I don't know, maybe that's jumping out of a plane. But trying to work out what that is, is also part of the you know, part of changing the way that you cope with any of the stresses or um, the down parts of the day. What can I do that will give me that same thrill? And finding that out is part of the process. Yeah. I think we we also spoke previously about using, we've talked about mini habits or micro movements to um, to change the way we behave. And if we do that to resist shopping and then congratulate ourselves, celebrate our successes, etc., et we can give ourselves a little hit there too. Yeah. You know, that whole streak of no shopping days can be in some ways just as addictive as the shopping because you feel such a high when you've strung, you know, however many together. I think that's uh, another thing to look at. Yeah. And given that a lot of people spend or acquire to some degree to soothe emotional distress I assume a good place to start would be with addressing (laughs) that distress is that a fair guess yep (laughs) next question you guessed it yep (laughs) okay yes is my answer there (laughs) there's a bit of a theme here though you know hoarding behavior is that coping mechanism and um emotional emotion regulation tools there's always underlying pain that we're trying to anesthetize with the behaviors so we really uh, for those who over shop you know particularly if we're over shopping new stuff there's one part of us that feels like we're entitled. I want it. I feel I deserve it. Uh, therefore, I should have it now. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's another part of us, possibly at the same time, that feels ashamed, weak, um, and maybe worthless when we give in to that urge to shop. And we we might have multiple parts. We might have another part of us that's anxious about missing out, you know, and another that might be proud that we found such an amazing bargain. So all of these warring kind of parts make it difficult for us to choose consciously with self-awareness in the moment and act in our best interest, you know, in a way that's congruent with our values. So all of these kind of warring parts of us, they're all trying to protect us and do something. But what it does mean is that we can't consciously focus in on what's happening in our in our emotional kind of landscape at that point in time. Um, so we talked earlier about addressing that distress means kind of becoming intimate with our triggers, you know, what leads us to acquire and then the repercussions of those actions. And once we know what our triggers and repercussions are, then we need to kind of look at them in context with our values. And common emotional triggers I know I've heard from a lot of clients, friends, family, you know, feelings like being sad, depressed, hurt, bored. (laughs) Bored is a huge one. I'm bored. I'm going to go shopping. Inadequate is a biggie. Um, Feeling needy or rejected. 
Um, this one's a big one. I bet feeling unattractive and, oh, if I go shopping, I might be able to find just the right yeah. thing that will make me look amazing. Um, you know, of course, anxiety, feeling doubtful, afraid, all of these things, you know, all of those kinds of emotions, if we can label, if we can name those emotions, we can perhaps find something different to help us with that emotional sense, you know. Um, feeling good's also a trigger, you know. Yeah, celebration, isn't it? Coming into money, celebrating a win or an achievement. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy all the things and it's going to be amazing. I passed my degree. I deserve the whatever. I exactly. completed my essay. I deserve, yeah. Mm, totally. Totally. And I think you're right to highlight boredom as well. I remember oh, realizing yeah. a while ago that I had got into a routine where, say it was a Sunday night and I was just trying to wind down, I would like look at Facebook for a bit, look at Twitter for a bit, then look at Etsy for a bit. It was like in my cycle of websites to look at when I'm bored. Etsy being, for anybody who doesn't know, like a bit like eBay, but for handmade stuff, it's beautiful. Mm, it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I know. <laughs> and once I kind of noticed that that was what I was doing, I was able to think, okay, well, you can look at Etsy, but not in this circumstance, because you can look at Etsy when you need something from Etsy. You can't look at Etsy because you've finished Facebook and Twitter. Exactly. Yeah. That boredom. And it's like, we do the same with food. I mean, I know I do. I go, oh, what am I going to do now? Oh, I'll just go have something to eat. Yeah. It's just, a, it's just a, a, a filler. And if you recognize that, that that gap filler is there, you can um, consciously shift away from that. Um, and a lot of it is just about understanding what those triggers are and there's some real need underneath that. There's a real need, some of it's social, some of it's emotional, and if we can identify that, then we can try and fill those needs with other less financially compromising <laughs> habits yeah and physical space sorry physical space yeah. <laughs> compromising habits as well definitely definitely so I have been trying a few things to reduce my own acquiring behaviors which for me is mostly online shopping that's where I often trip up so I thought we could go through some of those and look at whether they're useful tactics for listeners to try or whether they're not that advisable <laughs> and, and then look at some techniques other people use. Um, and, you know, again, the same, see whether they're useful. Excellent. Bring it on. Bring it on. So the Bring first one on. I've been trying is delaying. Often, when I feel the urge to buy something, it feels overwhelmingly urgent. I don't just need it. I need it now. And it doesn't help that Amazon Prime can get things to me literally the same day. It's almost too easy. So something I'm trying is telling myself I can buy the thing, but in a month's time. And of course, once a month has passed, I often don't even remember what I wanted never mind still feel a, an overwhelming need to buy it this is one I use <laughs> I definitely use the, the the delay tactic and I often use the wish list function of many websites as well like it feels like I'm you know it feels like I'm buying it but I'm not I'm yeah. doing it I'm clicking but I'm not actually buying it um and I often do bait purchases that I feel, you know, might be frivolous or other people might judge me about. But if I put it into my wish list um, and I still feel confident that I do need it, I can buy it next month. Yeah. You know, and often I go back through my wish list and go, what was I thinking? Why did yeah. I want that, I wonder? <laughs> That's a weird one. Why did I put that on the list? And it really does. It gives you the feeling of almost like you bought it but. <laughs> But you haven't, yeah. you just kind of put it on reserve. Um, I do think that, that delaying is a really good um, good tactic. And if you can wait, then I would definitely suggest that using using a delay tactic for sure. I'm discovering that almost the more urgent something feels, 
the less urgent it actually is. <laughs> part of you is just going, you need it, you need it, you need it. And the other part's going, oh, come on. It's just, you know, it's it's just a, you know, set of fluffy dice. You don't really yeah, need it, that. Yeah. It, it's a strange <laughs> thing. Cool fact, a crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Also, you can get health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short-term insurance plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage for you. Learn more at UH1.com. Hey, everyone. I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend, John Calipari. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Please. Another thing I've been trying is interrupting the process. So sometimes when I'm searching for things to buy or reading about things or looking at pictures, I feel almost like I'm under some kind of spell. And interrupting that process of buying can be enough to stop me. So one thing I've tried is installing an extension in Chrome. It's free. It's called Leech Block. I will link to it in the show notes. And basically, you can put in websites that it won't let you go to. So I've put in my usual suspects, eBay, Etsy, you know, a couple of clothes shops, that kind of thing. And if I click on them, it won't load the pages. Now, there are ways to bypass it. It's not foolproof. I'm not going to say what they are in case somebody hasn't worked them out. But it does <laughs> involve extra hassle. And sometimes just having that extra hassle to wade through makes me less keen. Some people find putting their credit cards out of reach serves the same purpose. If they have to get up and get it and bring it back to the laptop, then the spell has popped and they don't feel the need anymore. <laughs> and that movement, that getting up and moving away from it will actually, yeah, will lift you out of that almost that spell, Yeah, that almost dissociative kind of and, and actually moving, shifting into a new space can change that. But I think blocking websites is really great. We talked about that before when we did our habit pod, um, making the habit we want to break much more difficult to engage in. Yeah, like that process you have to go through is multiple steps to unblock. And that, as you say, will break the spell. Yeah. Um, and for some that might be taking it a bit far, but I think, you know, if it's if it's something that you really want to change, there's a need to, you know, to, to take kind of active steps towards doing that and interrupting, making it really difficult to get to those websites is another good way. Another thing I have been trying is prevention. So unsubscribing from promotional emails. For me, this isn't a huge one because I don't often open promotional emails. But sometimes even seeing a subject line from a little independent seller I know I love will make me think, oh, I'll just have a look at their website. It will put an idea in my head of something I want to buy. So the the prevention example I could think of was just stopping getting those emails. But for other people, it could be something different, which could be avoiding the charity shop, or it could be could be avoiding going to particular places that that you know will prevent you from getting tempted in the first place. Yeah, I think definitely unsubscribing to those sites that you tend to overspend on um, is a good good plan. I mean. <laughs> They use so many different tactics to get you to buy online the second time or the third time. Like, for example, you buy something one month and a month later they offer you 20% discount. You know, that's just an automated email to reel you in again. And you think that it's, oh, 
oh, I must be really special. <laughs> am I lucky, you know, that this offer's popped up or, you know, <laughs> am I being targeted by a sales tactic? But you fall for it. You kind of go, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll spend something. Um, and that's often, often there's nothing you actually need. Therefore, you buy something that you never use, wear or read. So it's definitely unsubscribing because just that email and just the title of the email and even the little uh, subscript to that can be enough to get you, oh yeah, I need to, oh yes, I need to go look at more stationery or more clothes or whatever it is. Um, A couple of other things for prevention though, um, stick with single shops rather than going like to the mall or the shopping centre because There's so much marketing magic being sprinkled in shopping centres that you'll just find it too hard to resist. And don't do any justs. That is, I'm just browsing, looking, sniffing, whatever. (laughs) When you're early in your, you know, in your um, reduction of of, um, shopping, because you will find it hard, again, to resist if you're just there looking. I remember, I remember teaching conversational English in uh, in Japan 20 years ago and asking, what are your hobbies? was one of the standard questions when you when you're first teaching them. And the most common reply was shopping. Uh, and I've actually had friends who said shopping is their cardio. So, you know, try find something else as a hobby rather than shopping. Um, chances are <laughs> it'll be a lot cheaper. And less stressful for your for your life. Yeah, yeah. And I think we touched on this last time as well. Just having an awareness that of the marketing tactics is powerful in itself. I have become aware that something I'm a real sucker for is oh, if you spend another ten pounds, you get free shipping. Spend shipping. another eight pounds, you get free shipping. <laughs> And I always fall for that. And I have been trying to actively not fall for that recently. Sometimes yep. it's a no-brainer. If if you spend two pounds, you get shipping worth four pounds. That's fine. But most of the time, it's fine. Like, it, it's okay to not hit the £40 limit for free shipping. It's okay to order exactly. £25 pounds worth yeah. of stuff. And mm, that's really hard to resist, though. It is. It? Like, it oh, is. I, free shipping is just this hook that seems to reel you in, and you're like, I really need to get free shipping. I mean, that, like, I, I'm not going to order it unless I get free shipping. And believe me, companies have been testing this for decades. And the reason they offer free shipping is because people like me will add another £10 worth of stuff to their cart. It's not, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because it's economically advantageous for them. Exactly. And you know what what upset, what kind of irks me the most is when you start putting things into your cart and you realize that there's nothing, there's nothing nothing you want. (laughs) (laughs) Either that you want or that's of the price that will get you over the line. And you're like, oh God. So then you end up spending twice as much to get one thing to get free shipping. And I'm the same. I've really tried to push back on that and say, no, hang on. No, you only need these things. Yeah. Shipping is only X amount, you know. Um, had this discussion today with my husband. He's quibbling over four dollars delivery fee. I was like, I said it will cost you more to drive down there or go on the train <laughs> to buy that than it yeah. will to just pay the shipping. Yeah. Um, but it is a that is a huge tactic that just reels people in. But once you start seeing it, that's a good step in in addressing it. I think. Exactly. Once you, once you recognise that it's it's happening, yeah, you've what you're already you're already um, a step ahead. Yeah. Another thing I do is ask myself strategic questions. If this was full price, would I still want it? If I had to tell somebody everything I bought, would I still buy this? How many <laughs> other things have you thought were essential but turned out not to be? And also, if the computer crashed now and when I loaded it back up, the basket was empty, could I be bothered to find all those things again? <laughs> and it can be a bit judgy, young lady. <laughs> a bit judgy like only against myself not against anyone else <laughs> if i had to tell somebody else would i 
<laughs> and you're like, no, John, John, John. <laughs> That's funny, though. You know what is so funny? I've actually just had my business cards printed up with the questions on the back for people about <laughs> – so I'm actually going to create a free download on my website with just those little cards so people can just Brilliant. print it out and stick it in their um in their wallet because it's a great reminder if it's something that you see when you open your wallet. How do I feel? Do I own similar items? Could I live without it? What if I wait? You know, um, and if you tend to buy stuff for other people, you know, do they need this or do I just want to get it so that I feel better about myself? Or am I buying this to get people to like me? Um, you know, those sorts of questions as well. But I really think this stuff is, again, once you're aware of what's happening and then start asking yourself these questions, um, and if at the end of it you feel, yes, I do need it and I do want it, I think chances are, yes, you do actually need it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't, the next time you ask those questions, you'll remember. Yeah. You'll remember that you didn't need it. Yeah, I think I think that is really, really good. Definitely. So some techniques that I don't particularly use, but that others suggest. One is only ever leaving the house with cash, not cards. What do you make of that? Yeah, I do think, I mean, it's hard at the moment because using cash is not as great anymore because it's kind of that FPOS life. I went somewhere the other day and tried to pay for pay for a coffee and something with cash and she didn't even have a cash, you know, register, she didn't have any yeah. cash to register. So, you know, that sort of thing is hard. But um, if you're really, really, really struggling, I could suggest getting rid of your credit card and getting a debit card that you use with just enough money on it to buy what you need. Yeah. And that way you'll have to actually transfer the money, you know, into it every time you want to go out shopping. And then you have a, you know, a damage limit. You know how much is on there and how much you can spend. Um, the other one I would recommend is I know, I personally know my credit card details by heart. And if I really wanted to slow down my spending, I'd get a new number issued so that I didn't remember it so easily because it's so, I don't have to think about it. I can just buy anything I want from wherever I am. Yeah. And that is not great if you struggle with spending. Similar to the debit card suggestion, you can get prepay credit cards, which mm. I think are often for kids. Like, you know, I will put, 10 pounds pocket money on your on this card so you can spend it but you could just as easily do that for yourself couldn't you I'm giving to the shops I'll put 40 pounds on the card and that's as much as I can spend exactly yeah I don't know we might have different ways to call them but that's what I would call a debit card so it's like a credit card but it's uh, yeah that's what we call them in Australia but yeah that's exactly what it is it's a credit card but you yeah you can only spend what you've got in the bank and that's what my kids have both got yeah yeah that's a good way to go because you know then you know hey I've got 40 bucks yeah because yeah as you say it's harder to pay with cash now especially since COVID. And also mm. I had to pay with cash for something recently and I barely recognised the coins. I was like, I don't know how this know works what... anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it is so quick how so quickly we got out of the cash society and like straight into the, the card. And it is so much easier to spend money with a card. Yeah. It's just simple. Tap and go. And it's like, oh, don't worry about a receipt, you know, if you if it's something small. That's another thing. Ask for ask for receipts for everything because then you've got that physical reminder that you did actually buy that. Yeah. That's another question I asked myself when online shopping actually was if I had to hand over a £10 note for this, would I buy it when in fact just adding a £10 thing to an online cart doesn't feel like much? Imagining it in cash. Exactly. Yeah. That image of handing over the cash. And that's what I always used to say to people, do everything in cash, but it's really hard now. We have to try and find alternative ways to get around that because having the cash, it's so much harder to part with. Yeah. You know, the physical money. Yeah. Another that relates to your um, suggestion of keeping receipts is tracking spending, whether that's on an app or a spreadsheet or just a notebook. Mm. 
yeah, I think that's excellent. When you write it down, it becomes kind of more real. And even rating the purchase afterwards, like sitting down and going, I bought all these things, you know, was that necessary, you know, rating it, whether it was necessary or unnecessary at the end of the week and kind of look at what you're buying that's unnecessary and there'll be a theme, there'll tend to be a theme. But also the other thing, tracking, spending, credit cards, et cetera, but preparing before you go and knowing, you know, your purpose for the trip, which types of shops you're going to visit, you know, how long you're going to spend there, you know, how much money you want to spend. All of that kind of stuff will give you structure because it's quite common to just go out (laughs) without even having any idea on what you need or want. Yeah. And that's where we get trapped because we just buy things because it's on special or, you know, um, something was shiny. Yeah, literally. That's me. I'm the shi- I'm yeah. <laughs> shiny. Yep, literally. I like the shiny stuff. Are there other techniques you've come across that can help people to avoid compulsive acquiring or shopping? I think plan- I think one of the, the main things is, uh, particularly if you're picking up a lot of freebies and, and things, I know that people pick up like um, – this is more in the acquiring angle. Yeah. Uh, picking up a lot of, you know, uh, pamphlets and things from the shops. And, you know, then you have all of these pamphlets and you might take more than one because just in case I lose one, etc. Mm. Um, things like that. I tend to encourage people to take a photograph of it rather than taking the actual, if, if, it's, if it's feasible. Yeah. Because that way, at least you can get it home and you can pop it up on your computer screen and have a look at it. Uh, when we didn't have phones and, and cameras and things like that, that wasn't possible. But now we can take photos of most things. I do that in shops a bit with books. If, I, if I'm if i rummaging through a bookshop and I find some books that I like, I tend to take photographs rather than buying them. And that way I can really think, is that something I want? Um, I, I, I want or need. Yeah, it's all about that. It's all about planning, being more intentional about what you're buying and being one of the harder ones, particularly for hoarders, is knowing what you have. That's the real tricky one. Do I know, do I actually have another one of these? I think I do, but I'm not sure. So those types of things make it tricky too. But attempting to, uh, you know, to do without something when you have something similar is also, you know, something we need to be aware of as, as you know, people who tend to hoard and save things. Is there something else that will substitute <laughs> when you're standing there and ask, asking yourself those questions? Yeah, I have become aware that when faced with a problem, often my first thought is, what can I buy to solve this? Ah. And again, since I've become aware of that, I'm a lot better at challenging it mm. and saying, okay, well, yes, that would solve it, but maybe something else could as well that I've already got or maybe something that doesn't involve a thing does if I'm having trouble I don't know oh okay yeah I have a bottle that's quite difficult to open and so I was thinking okay I need one of those jar opener bottle opener gadgets and then I thought well yeah you know that would help but also Years ago, I used to put an elastic band around the top of a tricky bottle, and that, <laughs> and so that's what I've done. Whereas, and it was only because I've become aware of that thought pattern that when I went, okay, I'll, I'd better buy a bottle opener thing, I went, okay, let's just challenge that for a second. That's genius, and that's exactly what I, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. The first, often our first. Particularly mod- in modern times, we just think that we need a thing to fix the problem. We really just have been conditioned. And that's just pure marketing. That's just that massive marketing machine that's working over time, telling us, oh, this is the only thing that will fix that tiny problem. Um, but we really do deep down know we can, we can problem solve. We can find some way of getting around it. And I think, being, as you say, being aware, hey, that this is my tendency, is 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 important. We have to remind ourselves that billions upon billions of dollars have been spent understanding what makes people buy things 
and exacerbating those conditions. Billions of dollars. Yep. It's not accidental that marketers sometimes get it right. It's all by design. Exactly. And you look at something like Amazon, for example, next day delivery. It's too Bingo. easy. Yeah. It's too easy. It's one click. They've even got it up there. It says one click, which, you, you know, we all know that <laughs> it, that is enticing because it's one click and it will be here and I'll have it. <laughs> and nine times out of 10, it sits in the box. I've just had a thought that's quite specific, but could I might be onto something here. I have friends who are very into Pokemon Go right? Ah. Which is an app on their phone and you go to different places and you can, I don't know, collect Pokemon. I don't know how it works. But I know that it's not just my friend's kids who are obsessed with it. It is very much my friends as well. And what I've noticed is that when we go to places, the thing they get out of it, say we go to a shopping centre, they're more excited about catching Pokemon than buying things when they're there. And so they will go out to catch Pokemon rather than to shop. I'm wondering if that kind of thing Mm. could be some kind of gamification. Yeah, yeah. Some kind of making your focus something different. Mm. And for a lot of people, that's currently Pokemon Go. Yeah. You don't need to do something else because you've achieved your thing when you get there. Because there is something disappointing about coming away from a shopping trip without anything isn't there there's a you know especially if you're a shopper it's like well you feel like you failed (laughs) I've been out and I've been there for five hours and I have nothing to show for it and having something that you know some achievement um is nice so that's sometimes why I'll go to a shopping center if I have to go and I'll um you know meet a friend there so at least I can have a couple with someone and and that feels like it's a you know, I've achieved something. I've, I've said hello to a friend and caught up. But yeah, there is something about going somewhere and not achieving the, the the goal of consumerist of the month. You know, I haven't been able to buy something and I've come home feeling deflated. Uh, but gamification, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about what I would essentially call a harm reduction technique. <laughs> which is a term I've taken from techniques used in services for people who self-harm or for intravenous drug users, like needle exchange schemes, that kind of thing. So something I've done in the past, but I would love your thoughts on whether it's a good idea or not. <laughs> if I've got to a point where I really, 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 really want to shop, I will buy things that take up very little space or need very little organizing. So for me, that's been stickers or earrings, both Mm. fulfill my, oh, isn't that pretty need, but I'm not lumbered with something that has to, I have to find space for, or I will buy books on Kindle Mm. so that they don't take up any physical space at all. Is that, I, I wouldn't recommend that as a day-to-day technique, but if somebody's really at the end of their tether, is it worth doing or is it still just exacerbating the problem, would you say? I think, I don't know, I think, I think because it's limited, you haven't bought all the stickers in the shop. You know what I mean? Like it's, and it's something that's, you know, it's fulfilling, it's, 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 it's fulfilling that need for something, you know, pretty and nice for the day. I don't think it's exacerbating any of the problems. I think the other way you could go about it is buying something that's, you know, completely consumable. Some people mm. do that. You know, they want to go and buy something that they can use or experience or uh, whatever. But sometimes that doesn't hit the spot. And I know things like, um, you know, like like, I know lots of people who will go out and they'll buy, you know, I don't know, little little bits of stationery or stickers or, you know, I think that's I think that's a harm redu- I think that's a good harm reduction technique, especially if it's, you know, you know that it's not going to take up heaps of space. You know that you'll probably use it. Earrings and things like that. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go. Uh, and then the other alternative is spending money on yeah experiences or services or something that will fill that up that need in a different way. Something else I've done is go on like the local food bank website and 
send them 20 quid instead mm. of spending 20 quid on something. That obviously doesn't solve the problem of spending money, but mm. it gives you definite dopamine hit, I would say. Mm. I could see that could become addictive in itself in a problematic mm. way. But again, Possibly. in a limited occasional way, you're doing something good for the world. And mm. there's not going to be a parcel arriving at your door the next day. Yes, exactly. And that dread when it does get, when you hear the doorbell, you're like, oh, another parcel. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, but that's one of the one of the things I, I've, I've, I've recommended, um, particularly as we come up to uh, holiday season, birthdays and Christmas, you know, you feel like you have to accept gifts from other people. And that's really hard to kind of change. But I think if you declare that you kind of want to turn over a new leaf and, you know, this year you want to change things and for Christmas or for for my birthday, I'd prefer, you know, for you to donate to my favourite charity. Yeah. Um, and that might actually break that cycle of gifts that you don't uh, that you don't want or need. You know, and if that doesn't work for them, maybe tell them you'd like them to give you tickets to an event and you can go together or movies or something. Um, and you don't have to reveal that you, you know, you've got this secret that you're trying to reduce. You know, you can just say, oh, I'm trying to reduce my consumption for the environment. Um, I mean, some of your friends and family won't like you setting boundaries and they'll want to keep buying you what they want to buy you. But stand firm and kind of be prepared to say, you know, I don't, I really didn't want that. Can you take it back? Um, because you're changing and some people around you mightn't like that. But there is there is a way to do that. And having a statement ready of what to say to people when they try yes. and gift you items that they no longer need, <laughs> you know, thank you so much for thinking of me. That's really lovely. But I don't need any more clothes, tea towels, books, you know, <laughs> if they want <laughs> If they want you to take a look, or just don't look because that's when you'll see something you probably do want. Just say, "I don't want to look in the bag." No, thank you. You know, but having that prepared is really is really a good idea. Yeah, I did a couple of episodes last December around uh, gifts, giving, receiving mm. gifts, and it was quite therapeutic for me to give listeners permission to get rid of something they've been given. Because mm. I was by default giving it to myself as well. And then I had a really weird experience that it took me a while to understand where somebody got me something for Christmas, last Christmas, just after I'd done those episodes. And I thought, oh, that's a bit rubbish. <laughs> like, why did they get me that? <laughs> and I couldn't, I was confused by that reaction. And I realized eventually, that I'm so conditioned to accept and keep gifts that I never even questioned whether I wanted them or not. Mm. And that since doing those episodes and forcing myself to look at it, it was the first time in years I'd looked at a gift I'd received and thought, I don't want that. I don't need that. Wow, I don't. that's a breakthrough. Yeah. And it was so weird and I just had to sit with it for weeks going, there's something weird about my reaction to this and I don't know what it is <laughs> to, till eventually I went, Oh, I'm just not used to questioning them. If I get them, they're mine. That's that. And the second it comes across the threshold, it's yours and you just absorb it into your space. It is really weird when that come when when you come to that realization. Like I think that happened for me quite a few years ago, and as a family, we've really embraced the whole no present thing at Christmas. Um, other than for the children, and the children are getting too old now anyway. I mean, all they want is money, so uh, to buy the things that they want. But that stage where I realized if I want something, I'll go out and get it. I'd much rather just spend the time with the family, not wrapping dozens and dozens of presents, you know, wasting all that paper and all that time. And I do adore present wrapping. I adore it. I hate wrapping, but I like giving. Oh, I just love wrapping. I love wrapping and I love getting the perfect gift. Yes, I love getting the perfect gift. I am absolutely that person. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
And I will really try hard to get just the right thing for that person and try and make sure that it's what they want and and need and all that sort of thing and then wrap it beautifully so that it's another experience opening it. But I don't need to do that, you know, over and over again with dozens of presents. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. But it is is interesting when that happens to you and you kind of go, I don't really – hmm, that's not really something I want or need or like. <laughs> and then you have that realisation. Yeah, and I that particular gift, I was so like annoyed with it that I didn't even bring it into the house. I left it in the car boot and ready for my next kind of charity shop donation run. And <laughs> my episode last week was about the endowment effect which is fascinating. Go back and listen if you haven't. But now I know that not bringing it in the house, had I brought it in the house, it may well have been harder to get rid of, even though I don't like it. Whereas because I -hmm. didn't at any moment feel any sense of ownership over this thing and it stayed in the car until it it went Mm. elsewhere, it was the easiest donation I've ever (laughs) given. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. Not bringing it into the house and having it kind of become a possession. Yeah. Um, I think. And again, as I said earlier, if someone tries to give stuff, don't look at what's in there because the second you've looked at it, there's an, a sense of, you know, ownership over it as well. It's it's why people want, um, again, marketing, why they want you to touch things. And, you know, that's why they like things to be sitting out so you can interact with them because that also increases that, you know, sense of ownership and 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 pleasure. One of the studies I looked at for last week's episode found that the endowment effect kicked in within seconds of being given something, within seconds. And that's why, yeah. like you say, when you go in the Apple store, they give you the iPhone to handle. It's why you test drive cars. It's why you try clothes on. It's everywhere. It's fascinating. Yep, yep. It's why you smell, you know, oh, the why they hand out the perfumes to you, you know, yes. as you walk past. You know, oh, wow, that smells amazing. What's that? And you're off looking for it. You know, it's all of those reasons why. And they know. I mean, they've known <laughs> <laughs> They've known that for a very long time. It's not an accident. And they ex- yeah. exploit it. It's exploitation. Merciless. Mm, merciless. Yeah. Mm. I was going to also just uh, recommend April Benson's book, To Buy or Not to Buy. Oh, okay. It's a little old now. It was written in 2008. Uh, I think it was published. But um, the stuff she talks about there is – even more relevant now because internet shopping was just kind of emerging then. Uh, But she has, she's actually, unfortunately she passed away last year, but she was a New York therapist and PhD who did a lot of uh, work for over shopping and kind of having it Mm. as a kind of, as a, as a disorder in a way, Um, you know, and in the big apple, the Mecca for shoppers, she had plenty of clients, but she sells. um, So the book, there's a book and then there's also a couple of like additional um, like workbooks that you can actually, I think she's still the person who took over her, her business still sells those, but really um, a lot of it is about digging in deep and finding what those triggers are, you know, what the costs are of you over shopping, um, et cetera. And being, being aware of, you know, really tracking how much you're spending and how much volume is coming in and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, she, uh, she, she, she did a lot of good work. Sounds good. I will include a link to that as well in the show notes i think i bought it on ibooks so that's another good reason you won't have to actually have the physical Uh, book (laughs) i mean i am such a kindle convert i know amazon is evil but for a number of reasons you can't lose your books you can't they don't take up space if you're going on holiday you don't need a suitcase just for your books. <laughs> I remember those days I'd have a whole bag because I'd have like 10 books I wanted to read on my holiday. Exactly. 
Um, it's easy to hold. It's yeah, I'm a complete convert. Yeah, I am too, to be honest. Unless it's a book I need to reference, yeah. if I need to refer to it, then I find it a little tricky. But for everything else, particularly you know, a quick trashy read, yeah, it, it's great for that because you know you're not going to want to have it on the bookshelf. You don't want anyone to know that you read it. To be honest, <laughs> like when when um Fifty Shades of Grey was the <laughs> book of the time not one I've read I have to say um the, I haven't read it I about six months later charity shops were getting so many copies of 50 shades of gray that one one shop went viral because it built a whole fort just out of 50 shades of gray books I will try no. and find the photo um, I want to see the yeah, photograph it was incredible it was like almost like a mini office on the side of the shop just built out of Fifty Shades of Grey book. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't... <laughs> even charity shops don't need your second-hand trashy novels. <laughs> exactly. You just need your Kindle and that's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jan, if people want to find you online, where can they do so? They can go to my website, to stuffology.com.au, or maybe Instagram, at stuff underscore ology, uh, Twitter, at stuff underscore ology, or uh, on Facebook, Stuffology Consulting. And I recommend going to stuffology.com.au and signing up for Jan's email list. I say this pretty much every time, but that's because it's always good. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jan. You are always full of wisdom. It is much appreciated. Oh, that's very kind. I've been thinking about how many of us have to keep our hoarding secret. I will get to the top tip of the week in a sec, but just for a moment, let's talk secrets. I certainly keep my hoarding secret, and I've been wondering about the effect that these secrets and the shame have on us and our mental health. I'm thinking of doing an episode about the secrets we keep about our hoarding. And if you feel comfortable, I want to hear your hoarding secrets. I've created a form where you can submit your secrets anonymously. I will not know who sends what. If you want to tell me your secret for a potential future episode, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash secret. That's overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash secret. Now back to your top tip. So this week's top tip comes from the ever wonderful Domestic Blisters on TikTok. Have a listen to what she's got to suggest. Okay, if you're wanting to introduce some new habits or systems into your home to make things a little more functional, don't shoot for the moon. Go for the closest to what you're already doing with a little increased function. Here's some examples. If you tend to toss clothes into a chair, instead of saying from now on, everything goes straight to the laundry room, try just putting a laundry basket there and putting things in the laundry basket. And now you can take the whole basket to the laundry room when you can. If you tend to leave dishes everywhere, instead of saying that's it from now on, I'm gonna wash every dish as soon as I'm done. Instead, try taking all your dishes to the sink when you're done and just leaving them there. Once that system becomes easy, second nature, and automatic, then you can try and increase the functioning. For example, maybe instead of putting it in the sink, you stack it up next to the sink so that the sink is accessible. If a system never becomes easy and automatic for you, then it just means that the system isn't the right one for you, or you need more tips and tools to get the system to work. The issue is almost never that you are failing or not good enough. And I can say from recent experience, this is definitely proving to be helpful from my point of view. So give it a go. Okay, thank you for listening and I will speak to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding podcast. You can find more online at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder find out more about how you can support this podcast and the overall project go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk 
forward slash support and do subscribe to this podcast so you make sure you don't miss any future episodes.